Thanks, Connor. Um, so I'm not going to take a full 10 minutes here. I just wanted to give a quick introduction to the session um, and kind of explain why we thought this was a good idea. Um, so we tend to think about um, some of these species that have really broad ranges in very regional contexts. So we talk about the forest health issues that we have in the Southwest, for example, and then uh, what's happening in Alaska, but we don't always put them together into a comprehensive view of what's going on in these, um, in a larger context, and in this case, Western North America. And um, a few years ago, as I started traveling around Mexico, the Western US and Canada, talking to people, um, it became clear that we we kind of make an assumption that a lot of our species are going to be okay at further north or at higher elevations, and we're relying heavily on what comes out as generally climate envelope models, which um, aren't giving us a, a great perspective in all cases. And um, it became pretty clear that we have some pretty severe forest health issues happening across the range. And so that's kind of the context for this. So we tried to pull together people who have been studying Aspen forest health issues across Western North America to see if there's some common themes we can pull out. Um, and so that's where the, the discussion at the end will come in. And so uh, we have some questions that we'd like you to think about and take some notes on. Uh, as we move through the different talks, and then we will use these for the, the discussion at the end. And if there's some nice themes that come out, we'll potentially move this into a publication um, with the, the speakers and potentially some participants in the audience. So the primary discussion questions that we'd like you to think about are what are the commonalities between these various threats to Aspen across Western North America, and then what are the differences between them? Um, and then the second one is what are the implications for management on this larger scale based on all of our presentations and, and these different themes that are coming out. And then we have some secondary questions as well. We're not sure we'll get to these in the discussion, but we'd like you to think about them anyway. Um, and so are there any threats that are out there but we didn't uh, mention or include here but that need to be addressed? And is there anything that you learned or think could be applied using somebody else's ideas in your region? Um, so how can we be more comprehensive in how we look at Aspen? And then finally, is this unique to Aspen or are there other um, sort of broad ranging tree species that have similar issues um, and why or why not? And I'll come back and put these same questions up at the end and also provide a link to a Google form where if you're interested in sharing your thoughts um, in that Google form, you can with these questions. So um, that's all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn the reins back over to Connor, who will um, introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Connor and Kristen, for organizing us. Um, and that introduction was great. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about Aspen and the Great Basin. Doug Shinneman is my co-author and was unable to attend today. So I'm presenting for both of us. I'm going to start by discussing Aspen and fire and then provide some of our research findings about Aspen climate relationships, as well as the role of disturbance in stands. And then I'm um, going to talk about a neat new project we have looking at low elevation Aspen vulnerability in particular. Here we have the North American distribution of Aspen, and um, you can see the Great Basin, pretty sparse Aspen distribution. Um, in our neck of the woods, um, lots of isolated stands, otherwise um, surrounded by sagebrush and shrubland ecosystems. Um, zooming in, you can really see that sparse distribution. Uh, Aspen comprise only about 1.5% of the Great Basin. Uh, and you can also see that in yellow, um, wildfire from 1984 to 2018, uh, a lot of the Great Basin has burned over 23 million acres during that time. 
And in particular, the area of aspen forests in the Great Basin have increased as well over time. About 300,000 total acres of aspen have burned from 1984 to 2018. Uh, aspen's a fire adapted tree species. So a question that we often ask is, will more fire benefit aspen? And I, I think what we're finding is that it depends. Um, the relative fire dependency of an aspen forest, some forests are fire dependent, some are not. Um, both Paul Rogers and Doug Shinneman um, have done some really neat research about this that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, also interactions with climate, such as conditions that affect regeneration after fire. Interactions with other disturbance agents, we work a lot on animal browsing and how that affects um, aspen recovery. And then also interactions with competitive species, such as conifers, um, but also um, invasive species, such as grass species, um, cheatgrass is an invasive species we're having a real hard time with down here. Um, and we are looking at some of those interactions now as well. So a, a really quick overview of aspen fire ecology. Um, most fires occurring in aspen can be considered high severity. Aspen are easily killed by fire and aspens considered to be a highly fire adapted species in part because it often proliferates after fire. Uh, aspen stands are often serial to other tree species, especially conifers that can gradually replace them in the absence of fire. And so many aspen stands are considered fire dependent. However, stable aspen stands that don't depend on fire are not uncommon, especially here in the Great Basin, as it turns out. Um, and also, especially when there's not a tremendous amount of conifer competition. We looked at some of these aspen stand dynamics in three mountain ranges um, in northern Nevada. Pure aspen stands, as I just said, are common in these ranges, but we also measured mixed aspen conifer stands and riparian stands that had a lot of pruneness in them. So a, a variety of stand conditions and species within stands. And a key finding from this work was that age and size class distributions suggested that aspen are largely self-replacing and stable in these areas, even in the presence of conifers and even without fire. Uh, the figure at left, on the left, indicates that aspen stands range from quite old to pretty young, um, based on the oldest tree dated. So there were a variety of stand ages across these three mountain ranges. And then the figure at right shows ample reproduction was occurring, um, the classic negative exponential relationships between age and density we saw across the three mountain ranges and also for the study area as a whole. So despite finding very little fire evidence in these stands, aspen are apparently self-sustaining at the landscape scale, which was great. <laughs> um, so we didn't have major fire events, that would have produced pulses of aspen regeneration through time. And instead we found that climate was clearly correlated with aspen establishment in these stands. I'm gonna go over this quickly and happy to answer any questions, of course. Um, this figure shows that maximum spring temperature at the top um, and PDSI, which is an index of relative moisture availability shown there in the middle, um, clearly align with the variability in aspen establishment over time. We think these findings suggest aspen clones are producing and storing carbohydrate reserves during wetter times, and then subsequent drier and warmer conditions after establishment are maybe promoting canopy mortality, which then is allowing light and inducing sucker um, growth following establishment. So um, I, we talk about all of this a lot. We, we think it makes good sense, but um, you know, we, we found this across those ranges and um, it was neat to look at all of these interactions in that particular study. Of course, other factors such as browsing of young aspen by wild and domestic ungulates could also affect aspen regeneration. 
In that study, we found a significant difference in the proportion of suckers reaching recruitment height between plots classified as either low or high brows in our study area. And for those that are unfamiliar, um, recruitment height is often considered to be around two meters. That's why we have that there on the y-axis because it's generally, that's when we consider the, tall, the trees generally tall enough to be less susceptible to mortality from browsing. In another recent study, we sampled aspen regeneration in various locations that had burned five to 15 years previously throughout the Northern Great Basin, as well as parts of the Rocky Mountains. Results from this research really suggested um, that winter precipitation in particular had positive effects on density of both overall regeneration shown at the top and re again, recruitment sized aspen shown at the bottom. The early winter precip ratio had the largest effect size and this is a metric that we developed that represents the ratio of average early winter precip during a five year post fire period compared to the long term average. So in other words, did the site have more or less early winter precip during the post fire period? Again, we found that that was um, strongly correlated to both overall density of trees and also density of um, trees that were over two meters. Uh, again, similar to our previous study, indicators of browsing pressure had a significant effect on recruitment densities. So we're certainly finding a relationship with animal browsing. And a new area of research that um, I, I sounded, I am really excited about it, um, but it's, uh, we're investigating the vulnerability of low elevation aspen in particular. Uh, Great Basin rangelands that border low elevation aspen are affected by a changing climate and non-native flammable grasses that are promoting these large megafires. Uh, the ability of aspen stands to regenerate after such events is dependent on factors such as climate and browsing impacts, and also on the health of the stand before fire. At lower right, for instance, we see a low elevation stand that suffers from multiple threats, including heavy browsing, with you can see almost no recruitment sized trees down there, um, an invasion of flammable cheatgrass, that lighter colored grass, and pinyon juniper encroachment there at the back. These conditions could cause more severe or frequent burning, and if combined with continued browsing, the clone may lack the capacity to successfully regenerate leading to um, potential forest conversion. So we're looking at these ecotonal shifts between asp or potential ecotonal shifts between aspen and sagebrush ecosystems. Um, this project is a project we're starting our second year and collaborating with Paul Rogers on this project. And we're really looking at how stable aspen are over time in both unburned and burned stands. So as far as the management challenges, there, there are quite a few. <laughs> um, we should expect unique responses among different aspen types um, that I mentioned briefly previously. Um, different aspen are going, to change, are going to respond differently to climate and fire. Um, for example, post-fire region responses are likely going to vary among functional types along elevation and moisture gradients. Um, we should also expect regional to local scale differences in climate change effects related to drought, snowpack, snowfall, and fire frequencies. Um, we should also expect the unexpected as novel combinations of stressors become more likely, including climate shifts and so on. And most importantly, we are concerned that these changes could lead to rapid and irreversible type conversion and forest loss. So we need to better understand and assess aspen vulnerability within different environments, and that'll hopefully help prioritize conservation efforts over the long term. That's all I have, and thank you all very much. Next, we will be moving up to Alaska um, with Lori Winton.
Lori is a forest pathologist with the U.S. Forest Service. She's based in Fairbanks and services over 115 million acres of South Central and Interior Alaska forested lands. She obtained her PhD and postdoc in forest pathology at Oregon State University. Take it away, Lori. I look a lot at a lot of dead trees and I like it. That's why I'm a forest pathologist. Uh, these trees on the screen were all killed by this disease we named Aspen running canker. We named it that because the uh, lesions can run all up and down the bowl. And you can often even distinguish them pretty long after trees are dead, like these ones. You can imagine a, well, you don't have to imagine, you can see these lines going up and down the tree. Um, and that is the margin at one point before the tree died, the lesion margin. Um, so these lesions go up and down the tree and then the point at which the lesions girdle is when the, is where the trees die above that girdling area. Uh, I'd like to point out that my co-authors on everything I'm gonna talk about are Jerry Adams and Roger Roos both of which who have recently retired, which is pretty sad for me. So I first found the disease in 2014. And as you can see on this picture, it's sometimes very colorful and quite obvious. It's also really aggressive. So in this photo, uh, I traced the margin of a lesion on September 20th. And then three days later, I came back to take the picture and that margin had advanced about a centimeter in just three days. And the green, the green bark there is where the tissue is still alive, but the discolored tissue behind that advancing front has been killed. And I often see these lines within a lesion where the fungus has paused, but I don't always know how much time has passed between the lines. Like this time, I because I drew with a wax pencil on it, I know it was three days between those lines. But sometimes uh, it looks like it might be almost even daily. These symptoms, they look pretty similar to the cytospora disease, but in our case, there's no fruiting bodies to identify. And Frustratingly enough, it took seven years to identify the fungus that causes the disease. It, enable, it consisted of doing lots of isolations from those lesion margins and inoculations onto healthy trees. And we finally identified the cause as a new genus and species with the help of Pedro Kraus in the Netherlands. So the pictures I showed you before were very colorful and that's always fun, it's quite photogenic, but usually it's a lot more subtle and difficult to see. These two images are of the same tree. The picture on the left are the lesions before debarking. And as you can see, uh, the lesion margin part of which I've pointed out with that blue arrow, you can follow it down all the way up and to the bottom of this image. But the yellow arrow is also a lesion. It's almost in, un, invisible to the naked eye, unless I debarked, scrape the bark back to expose that margin between the live and dead tissue. So since 2014, we found it and recorded it pretty much in most of the Aspen stands we've looked at all over the boreal, at least the boreal that's accessible from either road, river, or the air. So we did a study to, and published it last year to study the potential drivers of the incidence, severity, 
and distribution of this disease. We measured over 16,000 trees on 88 plots within seven ecoregions. And we found aspen running canker to some extent on 82% of those plots that we surveyed. Uh, most of these were forest inventory plots. But I like to note that 88 plots is kind of limited in such a huge area. And it was mostly on the roaded, access, road accessible places. And in one case on the upper Yukon River, which is a super fun river trip. So within those eco regions, we um, grouped the plots and found that the incidence of canker was variable among those eco regions, and uh, it varied from zero to sixty nine percent, and it was highest north of the Alaska Range, and I'd so from this, we can see that not all locations are equally susceptible. We also found that canker caused mortality within plots that had canker was relatively invariant, averaging about 85% across all those ecoregions. So once established, the canker, it kills a lot of trees and it kills them quite rapidly. We also found that uh, canker incidence is higher in smaller trees, but that's only in uh, smaller trees in older stands, as evidenced by um, this modeling we did. The odds of having canker increase when the means, mean stand diameter uh, increase. So that's our best estimate of stand age and with increasing aspen basal area. But the probability of canker decreases with individual tree diameter that are growing in very dense stands. So these are young trees um, in young stands growing at their maximum relative growth rate. We also found that canker incidence is associated with drought as evidence by um, increasing, increasing probability of canker with increasing vapor pressure deficit, especially in May and August. With each 0.25 hectopascals, um, there is an increase in probability of canker of 23% in August. So I first noticed it in the disease in 2014, but when did canker begin? Has it been there all along or is it something new? And so we looked at some old inventory data. These inventory plots were put in by the Cooperative Alaska Forest Inventory in 1995. So the first measurement was in 2000. And this data shows that mortality has increased steadily. Since, about, since at least the year 2000, at about 11% per year. But on all these, that's just mortality in these inventories. Cause was not recorded, um, so could have been caused by anything. But once we started the specific canker surveys, we saw that both canker incidents and canker cause mortality are also increasing since we started those surveys in um, 2013 to 2018. And so both incidence and mortality are increasing about 7% per year. So it seems likely that the older CAFI inventory mortality is associated with the aspen running canker as well. So our conclusion in that paper pretty much summarized as um, that the widespread mortality we've seen in Alaska is caused by an interaction between the pathogen, drought, and a persistent leaf miner outbreak. 
And this leads to carbon starvation and hydraulic failure. I'd like to point out though that, so we've concluded that the acid leaf miner is um, interacting and contributing to the mortality, but it's very difficult to tease that out in our study because there is almost no place in the interior Alaska that doesn't have this acid leaf miner. It's just everywhere, it's pretty remarkable. So we're looking at that in some continuing work in which we're looking at why young trees in those young stands are apparently immune to the disease, but in older stands, they're dead and dying. We're doing that with a shade cloth experiment and that picture shows uh, one of our shade cloth putter uppers like 40 feet up in the air and putting, putting out that shade cloth to carbon stress trees to see if that increases vulnerability of those young trees to disease. Right next to this young stand, which has almost no disease in it whatsoever, is an older stand in which there's plenty of disease. So the disease is in the area. And we're also looking to see if the shade and acid leaf miner are interacting to affect vulnerability, cooperating with Diane Wagner on that. This part is pretty exciting. We're also in this um, experiment looking at the plant immunity and gene transcription. So this transcriptomic study is looking at which, what gene groups are upregulated or downregulated by these interacting stress, stressors. And this is a very preliminary graph, just showing this volcano plot, showing that between diseased and healthy trees, um, there's a lot of changes, a lot of upregulated genes and some downregulated genes. So we're um, sequencing the genome of Do uh, Neodothiora populina, the fungus that causes disease, so we can help uh, identify what all these genes actually are that are being differentially expressed. So the ecosystem implications of, of this outbreak are um, changes in stand composition and a profound potential of change successional dynamics. It's uh, accelerating a shift towards conifers changing the availability of forage for moose and snowshoe hares who depend on aspen a lot. Um, it also has implications for biogeochemical cycling and its effects on GPP and patterns of carbon partitioning and storage and the effects on litter production and turnover. So one of the big changes are in vulnerability to fire and long-term effects on the fire cycle dynamics, which I can tell you are pretty significant these days because right now I'm sitting in a lot of smoke and it's really affecting my throat because it's very smoky here today. And um, I just wanted to say thank you and point out this fun river trip I talked about on the Upper Yukon was with Roger Roos and Jerry Adams, my um, collaborators. So that's all I have today. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa Boyd, and I actually just started a new job this week with the White Bark Institute in Eastern California, which is why I can't be there with you today. But I've worked in Michelle Max Lab at Northern Arizona University since 2015, studying the impacts of the herbivorous insect, the aspen leaf miner, on aspen growth and mortality in interior Alaska. And I'm really sorry I can't be there in person to give this talk and to be part of the discussion, but I'm still excited to share this research with you. And before beginning, I want to acknowledge all the funding to you funding agencies that have and that continue to make this work possible. Climate change has resulted in productivity decline and mortality of forested ecosystems worldwide, 
So while the direct impacts of climate, such as severe and long-term drought events, have been attributed directly to tree decline and mortality, indirect impacts of climate, such as increased damage by pests and pathogens, have also influenced forest growth and death. And these stressors also have and will continue to interact to influence forest structure under a changing climate. And northern boreal forests are particularly vulnerable to climate change driven droughts and insect outbreaks as temperatures have risen and continue to rise at a faster rate in high latitudes than the global average. This includes Alaska, where boreal forests dominate the central part of the state. And these forests are largely compo composed of black spruce, white spruce, paper birch, and trembling aspen. And with continued climate change, deciduous species such as aspen are projected to increase in dominance in interior Alaska as temperatures become unsuitable for spruce and as changes in the fire regime promote high deciduous tree establishment and survival. But the impact of insect pests and their interactions with climate on aspen growth and mortality are really important to consider when making predictions and modeling future boreal forest composition and structure, but have not been adequately accounted for in these predictions. And starting in the late 1990s, aspen in the interior have been damaged by their herbivorous insect Phyllosmistus populiella, or the aspen minor. And since then, this insect has continued to damage aspen stands across interior Alaska annually. And at the peak of the outbreak, over 300,000 hectares of the state were infested by leaf miner. And that's shown here in the left panel by the yellow. The leaf miner is a herbivorous moth. It overwinters under spruce litter and it emerges in the late spring and lays its eggs on the top and bottom of aspen leaves. These eggs hatch and the larva feed on the leaf epidermal cells, resulting in this mine pattern you can see on the right figure. And in this one, you can also see the aspen leaf miner larva. This mining has been shown to result in reduced photosynthesis of aspen, early leaf abscission, disrupted stone model function, and reduced growth rate. And because of the persistence of this insect in Alaska and its strong negative impact on aspen function and growth, we decided to address how the leaf miner interacts with climate to influence annual aspen growth, physiology, and mortality. Our first objective was to assess the impact of leaf mining and climate on aspen radial growth and stable carbon isotope signature. And then the second objective was to determine what processes led to aspen mortality during this current leaf miner outbreak. And then to increase our spatial inference for both components of this project, we also addressed whether the normalized difference in vegetation index a remotely sensed measure of vegetation productivity reflected these triggering measurements and mortality. And to address the first objective in 2016, we sampled aspen in four sites in interior Alaska where levels of leaf miner damage have been measured since 2004 by Diane Wagner and Pat Doak at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And on these trees, we measured tree radial growth and tree ring stable carbon isotope ratios, which I will just refer to now as Delta 13C. And then we used a mixed modeling approach to assess the interaction between climate and leaf miner on tree growth in Delta 13C. For climate, we use an index of moisture availability. We use the growing season climate moisture index. And then we also assessed whether NDVI reflected tree growth and tree ring Delta 13C. This figure has leaf miner on the x-axis and on the left, left panel we have growth on the y-axis and on the right panel we have Delta 13C on the y-axis. And during the outbreak, leaf mining significantly reduced tree growth, but climate had no impact. And that's shown here in the left panel. Climate interacted with leaf mining to influence tree ring Delta 13C as shown on the right panel. And more specifically, leaf mining resulted in a reduction in Delta 13C, but only when conditions were dry as shown by the dashed line. And this pattern was really interesting because, to us because it's the opposite of what is expected during drought. And it really indicates that leaf miner is dominating this Delta 13C signal especially when mining is moderate to severe. Here we have NDVI on the y-axis, the left panel has growth on the x-axis, and then the right panel has delta 13C on the x-axis. The left panel shows that NDVI was positively associated with tree growth, suggesting that this index captures growth declines related to leaf mining. NDVI also reflected the decline in tree ring delta 13C associated with leaf mining as shown on the right panel and therefore it's capturing leaf miner driven changes in tree physiology. And these findings really highlight the importance of accounting for insect infestation when interpreting NDVI trends in boreal forests of Alaska. Our, seven, our second objective to remind everyone was to determine what processes led to acid mortality during this current leaf miner outbreak. We also wanted to assess whether NDVI reflected tree growth and tree biomass growth and mortality. 
For this, we sampled dead and live aspen in eight sites across interior Alaska where aspen mortality was, re was recorded. And these sites are part of the longest run in forest inventory network in Alaska, which is called the CAFI network. And a map of all the CAFI sites is shown here on the right. And we measured the radial growth of trees that survived the outbreak and those that died during the leaf miner outbreak. Trees that survived will be called living and those that died will be called dying. We used a mixed modeling approach to compare the growth of living and dying trees, their canopy position and their size, and also assess their growth response to moisture and leaf miner. We also assessed whether NDVI reflected living and dying tree growth and tree biomass growth and mortality. This figure shows tree radial growth on the left y-axis over time for living trees, which are shown by the solid line, and dying trees, which are shown by the dashed line. This dotted line is the number of trees that were included in that year for analyses, so the sample depth, and that's shown on the right y-axis. And this dark green shading denotes when living and dying tree growth was the same. But after a drought in 1958, living and dying tree growth diverged, and dying tree growth began to decline, whereas living tree growth recovered after this drought event. So this median green shading denotes when living tree growth was greater than dying tree growth. Dying tree growth was further reduced by a drought that occurred in the late 1960s, and this co-occurred with an insect outbreak. And then lastly, this light green shading denotes the leaf miner outbreak, and gro growth of both of these groups was really low during this outbreak, but the growth of dying trees was much lower. Dying trees were also smaller in diameter than living trees when they died, and that's shown here by the left panel. We have tree status on the x-axis and DBH is on the y-axis. Dying trees are always in red and living trees are always in blue. Dying trees are also more often found in a lower canopy position than living trees, and that's shown on the right panel, where the number of trees in each canopy position is on the y-axis and then tree status is on the x-axis. And the lighter shades denotes, the lighter shading denotes subcanopy trees. During the leaf miner outbreak, living trees, living tree growth responded positively to moisture availability as shown here. We have moisture on the x-axis and tree growth is on the y-axis. However, leaf mining had a twofold greater and negative impact on living tree growth than moisture as indicated by this figure with leaf mining on the x-axis and growth on the y-axis. And during the leaf miner outbreak, dying trees only responded to leaf miner and they had a strong negative response to leaf miner as shown here leaf miner on the X and then growth is on the Y axis. And this suggests that leaf miner was the final factor driving aspen mortality. This figure has NDVI on the Y axis and tree radial growth on the X. And it shows that NDVI reflected the growth of both living and dying trees, but it was more strongly associated with living tree growth. Furthermore, NDVI was more strongly associated with aspen biomass growth than mortality. And the relationship between NDVI and biomass mortality was driven by these mortality events that were greater than 40 megagrams per hectare. So this figure has aspen biomass growth on the left panel, biomass mortality is on the right panel, and then NDVI is on the y-axis. And this figure in the previous figure I showed suggests that NDVI is a better indicator of surviving tree growth than dying tree growth and mortality during this leaf miner outbreak. And this is likely because dying trees were in the subcanopy and a lot less productive and smaller than living trees. Overall, our research shows that leaf mining has a greater impact on aspen growth and physiology than climate, and that trees that died were smaller than living trees, they were in the subcanopy, and they exhibited a 30-year growth decline prior to the outbreak that was triggered by a severe drought event and further exacerbated by insect and climatic stressors. And lastly, we show that NDVI reflects leaf miner-driven impacts on tree growth and on tree physiology, but it may not adequately detect leaf miner-driven mortality events because it more strongly detects growth of trees that survived the outbreak than growth of dying aspen and of aspen mortality. And these findings suggest that leaf miner really needs to be accounted for when assessing growth or physiology, mortality, and NDVI trends in boreal Alaska. And as the climate warms and insect outbreaks increase in frequency and magnitude at high latitudes, we should expect to see persistent and greater declines in aspen growth and increases in their mortality. And to further address the impacts of leaf miner on aspen growth and function and determine how this species will fare as the leaf miner continues to infest aspen across interior Alaska, Diane Wagner and Pat Doak are continuing their long-term monitoring efforts of leaf miner at these 
long-term sites that they established in 2004. And then also last, last summer, we installed dendrometers on Aspen at these long-term monitoring sites to assess how monthly variations in tree growth are influenced by leaf miner and also to link tree ring measurements to foliar nutrient measurements. That, thanks for listening. The title of my talk today is Aspen Forest Health in Western Canada, and I'm presenting this on behalf of myself, as well as Ted Hogg, an emeritus scientist from the Canadian Forest Service. So in the year 2000, the Canadian Forest Service initiated the Climate Impacts on the Productivity and Health of Aspen project, and it's a collaboration between the CFS the provincial agencies, as well as the forest industry. We have a total of 180 plots across 30 study sites. And what makes our project somewhat unique is that through a large portion of our network, we conduct annual tree level monitoring. And over the years, we've seen substantial amounts of mortality across our, our site sites. So I'm gonna to speak to you about that today. So this is a map showing the geographical extent of our site sites. You can see that we straddle a number of ecozones and consequently a number of moisture regimes as well. Concerning the types of information that we collect from SIFA, we collect the health data. So at a tree by tree level, we, we look at the health status, is a tree alive or dead? And we also look at the percent of the crown that's showing dieback for each tree that is alive. We also collect pest and abiotic damage agent information. And um, I'm wondering, Lori, if, if you think, for example, this image in the center here, is an example of the running canker that 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 you presented. Um, it was something that we left as as unknown. It's not that common, but we do see it. So we also collect mensuration and regeneration information, and we have an extensive tree ring database, and we have a number of other uh, types of data. Most importantly, the climate and weather data, and of the climate and weather data, the most important. Um, metric that we use is the climate moisture index. This was created by Ted Hogg and it's simply just precipitation minus potential evapotranspiration. And using the uh, CFS uh, program called Biosim, we can um, model the CMI over the landscapes. So concerning the factors that contribute to mortality, this is the model that we use. And we think that the two primary determinants of mortality are drought and defoliation. We do, however, in most cases, see a combination of other factors, other pests, including wood boring insects, as well as cankers on our trees. Rarely, but it does happen, do we not find these other organisms and that we can attribute the mortality solely to drought. So what I'm showing you now is a climate moisture index map for, the, for Western Canada, for the prairie provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And it's the zero line of the climate moisture index, which is a good proxy for the boundary between the boreal forest and the drier Aspen parkland. So starting in, in a couple of years after our, we established our network, we experienced our first drought and it began in 2001, but in 2002 was the most severe. And specifically between the areas, uh, the cities of Edmonton and Saskatoon. And a few years following this drought, we noticed a large amount of Aspen mortality in, in this region. So this is what it looked like from the air. This is in the, the Aspen Parkland, and you would see this for kilometer after kilometer, just dead and dying trembling Aspen. On the ground, this is our uh, cyphus site in, at Batash, Saskatchewan. In 2003, most of these trees were alive. By 2008, most of them had not only died, but they'd already snapped over. And you can see various uh, stages of regeneration that occurred following that. So, but we have had um, more droughts since the, the, the initial drought in 2001, 2002, primarily in the last decade. And what I'm showing you now is a 30 year normal or 30 year mean on the left. And on the right is a 2011 to 2020 minimum, because of course it's the minimums that drive the mortality. And what's unique about this, uh, this minimum, this decadal minimum is that it was driven primarily by a single year, which was uh, 2015. And you can see just how dry it was in, in Northern Alberta. And this extended into Northeastern British Columbia as well as Southern Northwest Territories. So what I've done now is I've zoomed into Northern Alberta with the 2015 drought and I've overlaid uh, 
uh, defoliation. Now, this was the first significant defoliation event that we had in our Cypher network across the entire network. And it began in 2011 and ended in 2017. And it was primarily forest tank caterpillar infestation. So it's in these areas of overlap that we see the greatest amount of mortality. So in those areas where we had significant drought and significant defoliation, we had the greatest amount of mortality. In those regions where we had either one or the other drought or defoliation, we had moderate levels. And in those areas where we had insignificant drought and insignificant defoliation, we had the least amount of mortality. So when we look at Alberta as a whole, and what I'm showing you now are the annual mortality rates, um, this, this is the picture that you see in Saskatchewan. It's a very similar picture, almost a mirror image, so slightly muted. And also the interesting thing is that the second peak of mortality in Saskatchewan is somewhat lagged or delayed behind the uh, second peak in Alberta. Based on our sites that don't, that haven't experienced drought and defoliation, we estimate that the normal rate of mortality is around two to 3% per year. And you can see how uh, much uh, most of our, our sites are well above this, this normal level. So what I'm showing you now are the years in which we've had drought, which is a climate moisture index of, of less than minus 10. And you can see that five or six years following the 2001-2002 drought, we had the peak of mortality. And that's quite typical. We see that we get these, these lags between the, um, the peak of mortality and the, um, the occurrence of the drought event itself. The other thing that you can note from this graph is that Alberta has had significantly more years of drought than Saskatchewan, so much so that if we look at a change in the climate moisture index, you can see that Alberta has certainly dried out uh, quite significantly in, in comparison to uh, Saskatchewan. So if I overlay the defoliation event that I mentioned, again, it began in 2011 and extended to 2017, you can see that this combination of, of drought and defoliation that's led to this extremely high rates of mortality, over 10% in a single year, more than three times the normal rate of mortality. And um, of course, these uh, uh, defoliation events typically begin in Western Canada and they move towards the east. And this infestation was no different. It did the same thing. And so it moved into Saskatchewan a few years later. And that's why we think that this, uh, the peak of the second peak in Saskatchewan is somewhat delayed behind uh, that in Alberta. So again, as I mentioned, the primary uh, more determinants of mortality are drought and defoliation. And so we did just a quick preliminary um, uh, simple regression analysis, looking at the basal area loss as a function of age, density, uh, moisture, as well as defoliation. We found that age and um, density were not statistically significant. However, interest interestingly, moisture, defoliation, and uh, more interestingly, the uh, interaction effect between these, uh, the moisture and defoliation was significant. And of course, this means that the amount of uh, mortality that you're going to get is going to be substantially higher than that you, you could attribute to just the summation of, of, of that due to moisture and uh, defoliation alone. So what I'm showing you now is just the decadal averages of the climate moisture index for the province of Alberta, the province that was hit the, the most hard uh, with uh, drought. And you can see that each decade it's been getting drier and drier. And so uh, we can also, of course, model that uh, through time. Um, and on the left, I'm showing the observed, the actuals. And on the right, I'm showing you uh, the modeled. And this is two different climate models and two different radiative forcings. And you can see that uh, looking at the 2011 to 2020 observed uh, data that we're well into these scenarios already. So the amount of mortality that we've experienced across the, the, the Prairie Province has been significant enough that industry has approached us looking for help and uh, trying to identify uh, stands that are at risk of mortality. And to do that, we've created an, the Aspen Risk Tool. And this tool is, is focused on, as you would guess, the, the primary determinants of mortality, drought and defoliation. And the tool is composed of two components, a mapping component, which is a, GIA, a GIS overlay of drought and defoliation over various time periods and also a field component where we go out into the field and perform prison sweeps and we collect other information, including the ratio of uh, dead to live basal area, as well as uh, certain marker pests, certain pests that you know if you have them in your stands, that the trees in those stands are likely to die in short order. So we began this, uh, uh, these trials with the forest industry last year in, in 2021, and we're continuing now. And the types of data that, uh, that are provided are the ratio of dead to live basal area and 
as you see this graph on, on the right, uh, this, this, this increasing line here shows the ratio of dead to live. And we notice that during these mortality events, this ratio in, increases quite rapidly. And this is a good indication that you're in some of these mortality events. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish the beginning or the end of these events, but uh, we feel this is a one good metric for doing that. Um, another thing that we do, as I mentioned, was looking at these, the incidence of these marker pests, these harbingers of death. One of them, for example, being the ambrosia beetle. We know that when we see that in our trees, that we know that these trees are going to be dead in short order. And we've added a number of value-added metrics for the, for the companies, things like uh, diameter distributions and the incidence of decay fungi, such as Felinus tremulae and so forth, other things that they would find useful. So that's the end of my presentation, but as a way of concluding statements, I'd like to suggest that we're certainly interested in leveraging our unique data set for the uh, um, purpose of uh, improving our understanding of threats to Aspen forest health. And with that in mind, or, or to that end, we certainly have had a long extensive history of collaboration. We're certainly open to new collaborations. So if you find your data set interesting, please let me know and we'll certainly consider um, uh, entering into a collaboration with you. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Connor. Thank you very much, everyone. So uh, thanks for that nice introduction. I appreciate you putting this session together. Um, what I'll talk about in terms of herbivory and resilience will overlap with several of the previous speakers. Uh, in particular, um, Susan and Doug's work in the Great Basin and, and my work uh, have a lot of, um, let's say, tangents. Um, and so there'll be some, some repeating material, but hopefully not too much. So here's my uh, roadmap for this talk, uh, briefly talking about Aspen lifestyles uh, and the key word there being variability. Uh, modern herbivory, uh, probably different than um, historic herbivory, and I'll point that out. Some of those things are obvious, some maybe not so obvious. And then herbivores as system disruptors, and that's really the, the sort of the nexus of this entire talk. And then PBR, no, that's not a popular American beer, but uh, process-based restoration um, is where I'll finish up there, hopefully on a little bit brighter note. All right. <clears throat> So Aspen lifestyles, um, I use this phrase a lot. Some of you have heard it before, a beautiful thin-skinned fire-loving clone. And then I often go through in detail some of the exceptions to that. Uh, and this, is, this speaks to the evolution of this, the Aspen sciences in general. Uh, if we try to type them simply, we find out that there's a lot of variability. Uh, they do respond well to fire, but as Susan pointed out, there are some systems that don't burn at all or very little. Uh, so a lot of exceptions there, even in terms of clonality and the really burgeoning field of, um, of seedlings and seedlings found after fires, true seedlings with new genotypes. So a lot of change in this field, a lot of variability. So putting, putting uh, parameters around the Aspen lifestyle is a little difficult, but uh, we need to keep that mind as, in mind as I go through this talk. <clears throat> So uh, it's important to understand base systems. Again, Susan alluded to this earlier, but there's different uh, functional types, or you may have different words for them. But in general, um, uh, across North America, we have the stable types on the right in the sing single landscape in Southwest Wyoming. And then on the left, more serial types in competition uh, with uh, conifers over time. A lot of our management gets st stuck into that bin on the left, uh, which is serial aspen. And this characterized by these, um, these factors here, uh, which is quite a bit different than stable aspen. And the reason why I bring this up is because as we manage these systems, we need to be cognizant of these important differences if we adopt this paradigm of emulating disturbances or emulating natural processes, which I'll get into later. So it's really important to understand base systems before you dive into how they're being impacted by ungulates and what might be some of the factors that would, uh, that would bail them out, so to speak, that would be responses. <clears throat> so the idea of working with disturbances, I've been spending most of my career talking about, and I was sitting in on a session earlier this morning uh, in a different context, Boreal Forest, where they talked about that issue quite a bit. Uh, but there's different kinds of disturbances, so things that move fast and come on quickly versus those that are more chronic and are moving slowly. Uh, this happens to be a landslide near Jackson Lake where you have aspen sprouting 
uh, after complete land clearing, a small landslide. So it happens rather uh, quickly. Uh, oftentimes there's overlapping disturbances and that's really where the focus of a lot of modern research is. Uh, multiple disturb disturbances appear to favor uh, work, uh, I'm sorry, favor Aspen, uh, when there is protection from browsers. And you can see me transferring over to the main topic here. Uh, the share screen thing is in the way of the uh, citation at the bottom of Dominic Kuwakowski, Tom Veblen, and a lot of uh, people in that lab have done this multiple disturbance work, mostly based in the central Rocky Mountains in Colorado. But it's important to keep that in mind. So as we talk about processes uh, where browsers are part of the natural processes versus where they may be interrupting natural processes. So when I speak of modern herbivory, I'm talking primarily about um, herbivory where um, predators are absent. And so Rocky Mountain elk there in the early winter scene, uh, this is a mule deer, Western mule deer, uh, but also domestic livestock such as cattle and sheep. And as we get into the boreal, both in Europe and in North America, moose are a bigger factor than the others. And so, of course, they're site specific. Now we, now we have forests that are uh, site and condition specific, functional type specific, and laying on top of that one or multiple uh, large herbivores, ungulates, uh, that uh, uh, vary in terms of their proliferation in different regions. Um, so it's, it's good to be aware of that context as we move forward. <clears throat> Um, in our region, uh, the Rocky Mountain elk, I'll show you this uh, little video here. Just give me a thumbs up, Connor, if that's working okay. Thank you so much. So this is a motion censored camera from Monroe Mountain in central Utah. I will replay this, but there's a couple things I want you to notice. The obvious is uh, there's a lot of elk and elk is a really big deer and it consumes a lot, but among, um, among the herbivores that I showed in the previous slide, according to Bork's work in the parklands of Canada and other people's work, uh, Rocky Mountain elk are the ones that really target aspen the most for their nutrients. Uh, let me play that again so you get a look at that. I want you to look at what's going on now, but also look at the pattern in this forest the height of the regeneration versus the mature trees, and of course the conifers moving in rather rapidly and probably being accelerated by the lack of understory competition in this particular cereal forest in a Colorado Plateau Mountain uh, forested landscape. So um, there's a lot of dynamics there, but um, the number one message to take from all ungulate management is that it's about the numbers of animals and their relative movement. Uh, and so uh, when we eliminate predators from the system, it affects both of those factors. But animals that can be sedentary or stay in one place and are not threatened by predators can do a lot more damage than those that are kept on the move. Uh, likewise, just reducing the numbers alone, like has happened in the Yellowstone system uh, with wolves and other, other predators, inclu including human hunters, Reducing the numbers alone uh, has been uh, quite beneficial to many aspen stands. Uh, the movement also doesn't hurt in that system. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention the work of uh, uh, overarching work of Lindroth and St. Clair in our review uh, issue of Aspen Topics, uh, volume 299 in 2013, Forest Ecology and Management. Uh, they have a nice review of a lot of the issues I'm talking about today. Um, when we talk about system disruptors, we're talking about chronic and undisturbed by predators ungulates. Uh, this is another case in southwest Wyoming. It's already a pretty dry, arid landscape bordering on sagebrush or non-forest uh, cold desert communities. Uh, this is a group of wildlife managers and a couple of forest ecologists talking, oh, this is almost uh, 10, 12 years ago about this stand that's really devastated. It's not gonna come back, let's be clear on that, without some real adjustment in the situation in terms of herbivores. <clears throat> uh, this is some work I did on private land and private land become refugia for animals who know when the hunting season starts um, and they show up on private lands where they're either hunted less or not at all. Uh, but this uh, um, non-metric multi-discant 
non-metric multi-dimensional uh, scaling ordination is really a landscape of data. And things that are closer together are more related in terms of about 20 variables here and farther apart are less related. On top of that, we have overlaid a subjective rating of stands in good condition on the right, generally on the left bad condition. And then this in between is, is uh, distributed without any, um, any statistical significance. The most important thing here is the x-axis explaining almost 70% of the variability uh, where recruitment is diametrically opposed to the presence of elk as measured in SCAT. Um, this is just the numbers to back those up. Uh, I've only highlighted uh, the ones that are in the blue vectors on the right uh, with their, um, their statistical uh, significance in terms of Pearson's R. Um, and this work, of, by the way, was published, oh, six or seven years ago in Natural Areas Journal. I don't have time to go into detail about the trade-off between growth and defense, but I do suggest you read this paper by Cole et al. with one of the best titles I've heard for academic paper. It's called Growing Up Aspen, and the subtitle I can't quite remember, but it really tracks their genetic connections between uh, defense and growth and how that works in uh, ecological systems. Uh, but that's an important factor. So some, some uh, Aspen stems or genotypes, clones, are focused and their energy on growth and escaping uh, browsing, while others are hunkering down and uh, investing in phenolic glycosides. So just briefly, a lot of my work is at this giant uh, Aspen clone thought to be one of the largest living things on Earth in South Central Utah called Pando. And it's essentially breaking up. This is an older version of this fencing, uh, which was ineffective. The animals are on the inside and they're browsing at will. Uh, uh, but this is some current data uh, in review right now. Um, but, but basically what I'm showing here is if you measure regeneration only, uh, you're gonna miss the picture. And it's so important to measure recruitment. And Susan pointed this out earlier, but we differentiate uh, regeneration as being that generally less than two meters in height and recruitment being young juvenile stems that are greater than two meters in height. And basically the area that's unprotected from browsing this past uh, remeasurement cycle had a lot of regeneration, but it, it doesn't really progress uh, to these other height classes. And matter of fact, it goes down to nearly zero recruitment. Uh, whereas these uh, different sets of uh, protected areas, we have uh, uh, two different fenced areas. It, uh, something's missing from my graph. It should be the 2013 fence and the 2014 fence. But basically, they show a progression in the 2013 fence and perhaps the beginnings of a progression in the 2014 fence, which is the photo you're looking at there. And we did some repairs on it so the animals couldn't get in as well. Uh, so watch out for if studies use only regeneration counts is my message from this, this particular slide. And this is an aerial view of the Pando clone over a 72 year period, and it's really breaking up. And I have data from vegetation as well as from um, browse data and regeneration recruitment showing three distinct forests sort of developing among the most genetically identical forest of this size in the world that we know of at this time. But if you trace through that, you see that it thins out and it thins out. It's not shrinking per se, but it's thinning out and dying, particularly in some of these areas highly affected. I'd like to point out in the lower right here is an experimental, uh, two experimental clear fell coppices that have never grown back within the uh, Pando Aspen clone due to browsing. And in this case, it's mostly mule deer. So moving on, I want to address the idea of process-based restoration. Um, how do we address ungulate management? You'll notice in this slide here that there's, again, very few young, and those that are in the recruitment class are dead around this group, this collaborative working group of, in this case, private landowners, uh, conservation group, university folks, and state wildlife folks. Uh, so Putting people together in one room, uh, collaborative problem solving is messy, uh, but it's, it's putting people together with different viewpoints and, and focusing on the problems on the ground. Um, this is a really uh, focusing on both the people and the process ecological-based management. So the idea of emulating ecosystem processes uh, in the previous discussion this morning, they were talking about 
uh, uh, the acronym END, E-N-D, is emulating natural disturbance. That's a different thing, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, natural disturbance is a definition that changes over time, what's our judgment of natural, versus trying to focus on our understanding of the processes and replacing those. In this case, if we don't have predator, uh, prey, um, consumption of aspen, uh, relationships intact, how do we emulate those kinds of things? Similarly, fire, how do we emulate that? If we don't have fire on the landscape, how do we emulate those processes? And then finally, and probably most key to all of this is this idea of adaptive monitoring cycle, which is talked about quite a bit in this field guide, which is available on our website free online or in hard copy if you come to our workshops. But the idea of, it's an old idea, it's a simple idea, but monitoring is driving your management. And a lot of times we forget or neglect monitoring uh, because we run out of funding or we don't have time or it's not as exciting as some of the other actions that we take. Uh, with that in mind, I'll end on this idea of the inefficient forest. This is a uh, another herbivore, beaver, driving this system and basically, in quotes, managing the forest with several different age classes in a very dynamic forest system. And this is where we come up with this idea of uh, PBR, or process-based restoration. I've stolen that from my friends that work at the um, at the beaver lab here at Utah State University, Joe Wheaton and company. But the idea being that there's a lot still that we can learn from uh, inefficient forests. We spent at least 100 years trying to make our forests more efficient. Uh, and then resilience is probably hidden within the idea of an inefficient forest. And that pertains doubly so to uh, managing herbivores where there's predators missing on the landscape. With that, I want to thank you and just acknowledge my supporters. Uh, and pass it back to you, Connor. My name's Connor, and I'll be presenting on some of the work that a collaborative group of folks here at Northern Arizona University and at the Forest Health Protection Office here in Flagstaff have been working on uh, on oyster shell scale, which is um, an invasive insect that uh, is posing a serious threat to aspen down here in the southwestern United States. Uh, before I jump into things, I do want to acknowledge the long list of folks and organizations who have helped to make my work possible. It definitely, uh, it's been a group effort and fun to work with such a wide range of people. To kind of put our work here in context, um, this is the map of Aspen's range across North America. And you can see down here in the Southwestern US, uh, aside from some isolated populations in Mexico, we are kind of on the Southwestern edge of Aspen's expansive range. And although Aspen is considered a foundation species across uh, the conifer dominated Western US, we think that its ecological value is especially pronounced down here in the Southwest where Aspen occupies really an exceedingly small part of the landscape, probably just one to 2% of uh, forested lands here in the Southwest. Uh, and also where Aspen patches tend to be much smaller than they are in more northerly parts of Aspen's range. Uh, and so these uh, small patches that provide a lot of benefits to biodiversity, recreation, tourism, cultural, cultural and aesthetic values, all these things make uh, maintaining and promoting healthy aspen an important land management objective uh, down here in the Southwest. However, an important uh, and emerging threat to uh, promoting and maintaining healthy aspen ecosystems is an invasive insect called oyster shell scale. This is a very small sap sucking armored scale that feeds on the bark of its hosts. Uh, you can see a photo on a small aspen stem here uh, and basically they are, once they settle in a spot, they're dormant in that spot for the rest of their life and they will feed, uh, they have a, a small piercing sucking mouth part that feeds on the fluid of cells just beneath the bark. This insect has been present in uh, North America since at least the 1700s when it was first reported as a pest of apple trees. And since its introduction, it's become a pervasive pest of over, over 100 deciduous trees and shrubs um, throughout North America, particularly in urban and ornamental settings. Um, but outside of these more managed, unnatural landscapes, historically, oyster shell scale has not been a concern in natural forest settings. 
That is until uh, around 2017 when forest managers in northern Arizona began to notice back of Aspen due to oyster shell scale. And since then, uh, the mortality has only seemed to increase over time. Um, and it's also, we've begun to um, learn about and observe uh, oyster shell scale natural Aspen stands in other Western states, uh, where it is also causing dieback and mortality, such as uh, most recently an outbreak that's occurring uh, further north in Utah. And you can see in the photo here, this is a relatively young Aspen stand, but, but this picture is taken in the middle of summer. So, uh, the tree should have leaves, but most of them have died due to oyster shell scale. Uh, and this is not an uncommon site at all, especially in our lower elevation exclosures here in Arizona. I'm not gonna get too much into the insect's biology just for the interest of time, but I did wanna show a couple of photos of the damage that it's feeding causes. On the left, uh, photo on the left here shows an intense oyster shell scale infestation and beneath their feeding, you can see as the aspen tree's bark is starting to crack, uh, which is something that we commonly observe in these dense infestations. Uh, and this tree is probably not too far away from death. And then in the photo on the right here, you can see the left side of this small stem is heavily infested with oyster shell scale. Uh, and you can see that black necrotic tissue potentially caused by some sort of virus, uh, which looks a lot different than the right side of that stem where there's no oyster shell scale. And you can still see some of that green living tissue beneath the bark. So to get a better sense of where oyster shell scale occurs across northern Arizona and the impacts that it's having, our research group conducted a regional survey with help from local foresters to try and determine where the insect does and doesn't occur. And you can see in the maps here, a red triangle indicates a site where oyster shell scale was observed and the black dots indicate uh, sites where oyster shell scale was not present on Aspen. One of the main findings from this regional survey was that oyster shell scales are pretty widespread in northern Arizona. It's not just a few isolated outbreaks. Um, it really seems to occur across the region. Uh, but importantly, it seems to be limited to lower elevation sites, generally below about 2,500 meters. Uh, 2,545 meters is the highest uh, observation that we've seen yet. And just for context, this really represents kind of the lower half of where Aspen tends to occur here. Um, Aspen generally occurs about 2,000 to 3,000 meters here. So oyster shell scale is present in the lower half of that range. We also sampled a few sites with known infestations um, more intensively, not just presence absence, but to determine the level of infestation. Um, and what we found is was quite concerning in that oyster shell scale seems particularly pervasive on and damaging to advanced regeneration. So you've heard a lot of, um, in Paul's talk and some of the other talks about the importance of looking at recruitment to um, determine Aspen stand health and long term sustainability. And what we found is that although oyster shell scale affects stems in all four of these size classes ranging from short regen up to overstory trees. Uh, it really seems to prefer this tall regen size class, um, which you could think of advanced regeneration or, or even early recruitment. Uh, these tall regen stems are taller than 1.4 meters or dBH, uh, and then they're smaller than about five centimeters dBH. We also noticed that there was higher mortality in this size class uh, as well. And this is a huge issue because uh, we already have uh, low levels of this tall regen recruiting size class um, throughout Arizona. And so one of the main management strategies that foresters will use here is building these fenced exclosures to exclude ungulates. Uh, and typically these have been quite successful. As you can see in the photo here, uh, there's abundant regen and recruitment happening inside the fence and essentially no recruitment happening outside the fence. Uh, but we're concerned that with high levels of uh, infestations in exclosures and on recruiting stems that the long-term success of this management strategy uh, may be threatened. I'm next just going to quickly highlight three reasons why we're concerned that oyster shell scale might become a high impact invasive species, not just in Arizona, but potentially in other western states as well. The first is its hypothesized role as a sleeper species. Uh, tied in with that are potential interactions with climate change. Uh, and then I'll conclude by talking about the insect's polyphagous nature. So for those who aren't familiar, a sleeper species um, is basically a species, a non-native species that establishes in the novel area 
uh, but has maintained at low population sizes and has low, low population growth for some extended period of time due to an, uh, a limiting biotic or abiotic condition. But what characterizes the sleeper species is that uh, at some point that biotic or abiotic limiting factor is lifted and the population essentially awakens, experiencing rapid population growth and invasive behavior. And so what we hypothesize is that this is an insect that's been in the U.S. for three centuries now. We know that it's been uh, on Aspen in Arizona for at least three decades, but it wasn't until about five years ago that we began seeing mortality in these uh, intense outbreaks. Uh, and so we hypothesize that OSS is a sleeper species that has awakened here in Arizona. And we're concerned that it might awaken in other areas as well. So oyster shell scale has been observed in Utah, New Mexico, and Nevada on Aspen and natural forest areas. Um, and so we're concerned most of these, are these areas outside of Arizona, oyster shell scale has a relatively low population size, uh, but we're concerned that as a sleeper species, outbreaks may occur in the future. So a logical question is, well, why, if it's been present on Aspen in Arizona for three decades and in the US for so long, why are we just now seeing these outbreaks? What actually awakened oyster shell scale? And although we don't know the answer for sure, a likely explanation is climate change. So really in the past 20 years here in the Southwest, we've seen increased temperatures in summer and winter and decreased summer and winter precipitation. And so we hypothesize that these climatic changes have led to the outbreaks of moisture shell scale. And there are really two potential explanations for why climate could trigger the outbreaks. The first is there could be increased host susceptibility. So we know from work on sudden aspen decline in Colorado that environmental stress uh, predisposes aspen to insects and diseases. So potentially drought stress, especially at lower elevations has facilitated these outbreaks. Alternatively, uh, warmer temperatures could have directly improved conditions for oyster shell scale populations, by increasing the species fitness and abundance. And then the last point here is just in, uh, oyster shell scale's polyphagous nature. This basically just means that it's a generalist that infests a wide range of hosts. You can see a list here of genera that oyster shell scale has been documented on globally, and this is by no means a comprehensive list. Uh, it seems to like basically anything that's woody and has relatively thin bark. And we've begun compiling, compiling a list of hosts uh, that OSS has been observed on in the Western US. Uh, we've found almost 20 hosts so far. And concerningly, these like snowberry and ceanothus are common understory plants, which really complicates management of this insect. It's not enough to be uh, looking at silvicultural solutions that just uh, manage overstory trees. You really need to be thinking about the site as a whole um, and oyster shell scales presence on these understory plants really complicates management. And so I'll just conclude by putting a plug in for a paper that our group published in Biological Invasions last year that goes into much more detail on everything I've talked about today. Um, it also has some more information on the insects biology and some potential management strategies and challenges as well. And you can access that through the QR code there if you'd like a PDF. Uh, and with that, feel free to put any questions in the chat or uh, feel free to reach out to me on email or on Twitter as well. Thank you all so much. Well, the, the title is Unexpected Genetic Structure in Mexican Popul uh, Populus Tremoloides. It's a genetic um, study because uh, we have nearly nothing uh, about uh, information, genetic information about this, this tree in Mexico. Well, everybody know that's a very important tree species in, in North America, but also we have this tree in, in Mexico in little and small population, but a lot of small populations. And yes, the its genetic structure is unknown. And so we have a, a bigger study about this question. Um, we uh, analyzed the genetic diversity and differentiation of 91 populations in, in all parts of the Mexican distribution. And 
used more or less 30,000 filtered SNPs for this. Well, here is the methods, maybe not so important now for the time. And in total, we found more than a half million of SNPs than uh, some filters to eliminate errors and, um, and find uh, the, 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 the best SNPs too. Well, then we uh, analyzed we uh, calculate the observed heterozygosity, the expected heterozygosity, and the breeding coefficient in every stand. And this with some um, calculation in error, some package here. Uh, below we see some populations uh, in the in, in north of Durango, in the state of Durango. That's uh, it's the biggest population with uh, 50 hectares. Mostly the populations are very small, only stands of more or less a half hectare, maybe sometimes only some trees. And the results, well, in the genetic, the genetic diversity was not so much. It's, it's not new, it's, it's, it's uh, logical because the populations are small, but very interesting, the, the, the F uh, index, the, the, um, this was very, very low, below the zero and sometimes near to zero one, um, um, me, um, minus one, sorry. And, and so we have we found in many population uh, extreme heterozygosity uh, or excess of heterozygosity. And when we combine it, and this, this is very different to the populations of United States and Canada. In these places, we found something between zero, zero and 0 0.5. And when we combine these two uh, indices, genetic diversity and the, the excess of heterozygosity, we find a positive correlation that's uh, very different to the other places in North America. And so that's the only feature for you that can see this, this, this crazy correlation. And there are some uh, causes until now, it's not clear uh, why we find a so, a so uh, a small breeding coefficient in these uh, populations, but there are some, some uh, possibilities. For example, well, we know the uh, pinus, uh, uh, populus tremoloides is a diosis species. We have a female and male um, um, individuals, and that can produce by a binomial sampling error this excess of heterozygosity. That's one explication, but that's not all. Then this excess um, maybe is not generated by the DOC but probably by the absence of individuals produced uh, by selfing. Because we have female and uh, male uh, individuals, but uh, not so much in the small populations. And then there are other explications, for example, negative associative matting and we found in the last time more evidence of overdominance by proxessive selection against deleterious recessive allelids. And, uh, and we think this is a long uh, selection process uh, after the last uh, uh, glacial time in Mexico, more or less 20,000 years ago in the higher mountains. And in this time, the, in this time, the, the population were much, much uh, bigger, uh, larger. And, and uh, with the time, there was a dying and dying and this and, and, and a selection. 
And so we have only genotypes now in these places that are more generalist, more generalized. Or, or we have more um, genetic loci with that are heterozygotes. And, and that's maybe the, the answer of, of this question because of this strange uh, correlation. Well, so the, our conclusion is, yes, we are, we are the conclusion is that the, um, we have the, the occurrence of pa uh, partially asexual propagation in small populations negatively affecting both the value of, of uh, the het, uh, expected heterozygosity and the F the FIS, the excess of heterozygosity, can well explain the indirect positive relationship between, between these two indices. However, negative assertive matting and proxessive selection against homozygotes or the life, lifetime uh, cycle may be also create such unexpected and unique genetic relationships. Well, there is a funding from Corner Seed, and we work together with Quebec. There was a other fund from, from Quebec too. Uh, in this study, uh, working free students and many many workers, many field techniques uh, were, were included in the study and many thanks for, for all this work. Here we can see a typical uh, stand, uh, Populus tremolilus stand in Mexico, together with many other three species, pine species together, uh, but also together with the fur, and and uh, suga mensesi and and bisea spruce species and so on. There, there is very uh, these uh, places normally there are a high um, um, biodiversity in, in within. And interesting, you present many many problems in the north of the distribution of the species. In Mexico, we find not so much uh, pests in this moment. And um, the, the population are, are very small, but, but uh, only 20% of this population are clones, complete clones. We find in 70% in of the population male uh, trees and, and, and female trees together. But in the last time, we cannot find found many uh, seeds or and and flowers. Well, that's my participation in this in this in this uh, special part of the congress. Thanks, Christian. It's interesting to see the photo of Aspen down there, and I'm really glad you could make it because I feel like a lot of times. Aspen in Mexico gets ignored, so it's good to have uh, your perspective. So thanks. Welcome. Thank you guys so much for participating in the session. It was awesome, despite the fact that we couldn't be in the same physical room. Uh, it was great to learn from everyone and ha have us all in one place. And I look forward to hopefully continuing this discussion uh, beyond the end of the session. Yeah, and if you have any thoughts in the meantime, um, you can contact us. And I forgot to put this up there, but there's <laughs> both of our emails. Um, yeah, and thank you again for participating.